let's take something like autism. Or let's go to the Marcus Autism Center. That's now about 20 years old, and I, when I started it, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't have a clue. And I was introduced to autism. We knew there was a developmental disability. That's what we called it in those days. We didn't have a clue what it was. We started that in two trailers at Emory University, and we were taking care of kids, and no one knew what autism was, and it was terrible. The lines got longer, and we just couldn't ever make a dent. So we built a bigger place, and the lines got longer. It took a year for one of our doctors to see a kid. Now you have to understand something with autism, if you don't see a kid by the age of two, three, uh, their life goes by. At the age of four or five, you can't really do with them what you can at the age of two or three. You could change their life by the age of two or three. And, and we, got, we just got inundated. I was carrying this by myself. The state didn't help us. The federal government didn't help us. We couldn't charge enough to anybody. That, because all these people were destitute, honestly. Even if you're middle class or upper middle class, you have an autistic kid, you're going to go broke because you can't pay for how long it takes. It costs $100,000 a year to take care of an autistic child. That's what it costs in private practice. So we were inundated. We, and I could tell you that by the seventh, eighth, ninth year, it was financially, it was going down the drain, but we were taking care of children. And every time I would say, that's it, I'm closing the place, I would go down there and I would take a look and mothers would come running up to me and start hugging me and with tears in their eyes and thanking me for what they did to their children. And their eyes stuck, stuck for another year, nothing I could do. And we threw millions and millions of dollars into it. And I think that most people would have run away from it. The point I make is that we were doing good, and, but, it, but it wasn't working economically. And then finally, one day, I realized that the reason it wasn't working is because people didn't understand autism. So I recruited Bob and uh, Suzanne Wright, who had an autistic grandchild, and I went to them and said, you need to get involved with this, and if you get involved, I will finance you for the first five years. I'll give you $5 million a year for five years. And Bob Wright was a great executive, and I said, if we can make the world aware that autism is out there, It'll make it easier for me to get money from the state and federal government because if the, at the rate this is going, it's never going to be successful because when I die, what's going to happen in this place? It's not going to be successful. So they started Autism Speaks. So we had the Marcus Autism Center. Autism Speaks now became a national thing. It brought the awareness of, of autism to all the po politicians, now the state governments, the federal governments, everybody knew about autism. Now we brought the state in and we said, hey, we need to raise money. Well, the state opened up the coffers and now they started writing checks for us and started to help us. And then we merged with Children's Health Care of Atlanta. And all I can tell you is that from a financial disaster, it's turned into one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life. We've taken care of about 60,000 children. Last year, we took care of 7,000 children. We are taking care of autistic children throughout the state of Georgia, all over the state of Georgia. We're teaching educators how to deal with these kids. Autism Speaks is now worldwide. I mean, we have a UN day of autism. We, everybody is turning blue, except for the White House. He haven't agreed to do it, but every other place is turning blue on, on autism day. So when you, when you think about autism today, it, it, everybody knows about it. Everybody's aware of it. And you take the clock and go back 10 years. Nobody knew about it. And these kids all had it. They all had it. And so now it's everybody's focused on autism. And now all of a sudden, because of Autism Speaks, there's research going on all over the world. Well, the numbers are starting to change now. And now more money is going into autism because it's become, it's become an epidemic in people's eyes. So that started from two trailers in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where it started from. And had I not stayed with it over those years, had I really thrown in the towel, today I think we'd still be back where we were 10 years ago with these parents who have autistic children absolutely struggling. You have no idea. I can't even explain the struggle to you. I can't explain what it does to a family, how it devastates the family emotionally, financially, Philosophically, the other kids in the family suffer dramatically. It, it sucks in the relatives, the grandfathers. It's total, absolute devastation. And today we see a bright light that something good is coming out of it. And it started with two trailers in Atlanta. Now, my lesson to, to philanthropy is that 
if something is good and it's not working, then you have to put your resources, which is not only the money, but you have to put your mind into it. People need your mind. You're the guy that made it. You're the entrepreneur. You're the guy with the ideas. You're the guy that, that, that understands objectives. You're the guy that understands budgets. If you put your head and mind into it and it's good, the key is if it's good, if it does good, if it's important, if, it, if it's something that's desperately needed, then you have to continue your philanthropy. You have to be patient with it and you have to stay with it. And your talents will make it happen.